I was thinking, um, I was thinking as so we were uh, singing that song, how much um, we all like to be praised. We like to be told how much we're loved. Or is that just me? Do you like to be praised and admired and spoken well of and to, and then you love to hear how much you're loved by your spouse, your family, uh, your kids, your friends, things like that. And we're finite. How much more does Jesus love to be praised and adored and told how much he's loved, right? This is, we're talking about an infinite God here, and it's a whole nother level, right, of desiring praise and and loving praise, and really, at the end of the day, we're not worthy of any praise, but he's worthy of all praise, and uh, so you know he just has got to be there uh, taking in all of this praise and this adoration, which is so appropriate, and uh, loving it and appreciating it when his people, those that he's rescued from sin and death, those for whom he died, uh, are expressing their love for him, for who he is and what he's done for us. So, well, as I was anticipating reading Psalm 51 this morning and kind of looking ahead as we read through a psalm a week, um, I can't read Psalm 51 without immediately thinking of It's companion psalm, Psalm 32. And I don't know if you know that. There are certain psalms that that have companions. They're, you could call sister or brother psalms. Uh, They they really go together. And uh, you really can't understand one without understanding the other. And uh, and so Psalm 32 uh, is really the companion of Psalm 51. And I thought this would be an appropriate Sunday to to go back to Psalm 32 and revisit this psalm, and it's been years since we looked at this together. And um, again, this is one of my favorite psalms. I'm sure it's a favorite of many of yours as well. But let me read it to you. Again, a psalm of David, and the title in my Bible is Blessedness of Forgiveness and of Trust in God. Listen to the words of David. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Father, as we have a, an opportunity to consider further this man after your own heart and how he came clean before you after he sinned royally, against you. Lord, we can relate so well to what we've read already in Psalm 51, what we've just read here in Psalm 32. We live in these Psalms every day of our lives. And so I pray that this morning you would help us to see the gospel clearly from this Psalm. And those that may have never yet responded to the gospel, they're still living in their sin. They don't know the joy of forgiveness 
that today would be the day of their salvation. And for those of us that need to get cleaned up every so often, maybe more often than we'd like to admit, by confessing sin and getting right with you and claiming the blood of Jesus upon our sin as believers. I pray that this would be a refreshment to our soul, a good reminder to, to keep short accounts with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my most un, unforgettable experiences in high school was my American Lit class, believe it or not, and uh, some of the things that we were assigned to read, and uh, really the most unforgettable short story I think I ever read in high school was Edgar Allan Poe's classic, The Telltale Heart. I know some of you probably are familiar with that story. If you're not, it's a, it's a grisly tale of a man who cared for an old man with a clouded eye. And this distorted eye haunted him day and night. And whenever he looked at him, his blood would run cold. And over time, this man developed an irrational fear of this elderly man's eye to the point that he plotted to take his life and rid himself of this hideous looking eye forever. And so for many nights, he would open the door of the old man's room about midnight and he would watch and wait for the perfect moment to strike. But the old man's eye was always shut and so he lost his urge to kill him. But one night, while he was peeking at the old man from be- behind the door, the old man got startled and he shot up in his bed and he looked at him with that dreadful eye. And in a wild rage, the man leaped into the room. He dragged the old man out of bed and he pulled the bed on top of him, crushing him to death. And he proceeded to dismember the body and conceal the parts underneath the floorboard in the old man's room. And he was congratulating himself at how clever and how cunning he was in carefully hiding all the signs of his crime when suddenly he heard a knock at the door. It was the police who had been summoned by a neighbor who had heard the old man scream. And so the man cheerfully opened the door and welcomed the police in and told them that it was he who had screamed. And uh, in a dream, he had had a dream, a bad dream, and he had screamed and the old man was out of town. And So he invited them to make a thorough search of the house and he enthusiastically led them to the old man's room. And he was so confident that they would not find any evidence of foul play. He brought chairs into the room and encouraged them to sit and rest and he boldly placed his own chair on the very spot where he had hid the corpse beneath the floor. The police suspected nothing but as they talked with the man, His head began to ache, his face turned pale as he faintly heard what sounded like the beating of the old man's heart resonating from under the floor. The imagined beating grew louder and louder and he became paranoid at the fact that the officers seemed not to hear it too. And so he began to nervously pace the floor while the policemen continued to chat pleasantly with him and the beating got so loud that he thought for sure that they could hear it and he knew and that they knew what he had done and were purposely making sport of him. And when he finally couldn't stand it any longer, he confessed to the crime and he frantically ripped up the planks and showed them where he had hidden the body. I tell you that gruesome story because I think it brilliantly depicts the inner workings of a guilty conscience that results from hidden sin. We all know what it's like to sin and then to try to cover it up. And the longer we conceal it, the louder our conscience pulsates within us and we become paranoid suspecting that others know about our sin. And the guilt becomes so all-consuming that we can hardly stand it. And sometimes we feel so guilty about what we've done that we think that God will never forgive us. That might describe you this morning. You might have some secret sin hidden under the floorboards of your life today. 
You're carrying guilt around you with wherever you go, at, at home, at work, at school, at church. You're, you're living in bondage to guilt. And God wants you to know that you don't have to live that way. You don't have to live with a guilty conscience that he can and will permanently free you from your guilt no matter what is causing it. There's absolutely no sin that is great enough to put you beyond the reach of his forgiveness. But in order to experience God's forgiveness and be free from guilt, you must be willing to come completely clean with God. You need to rip up the planks, if you will, and and show him your sin and confess your sin to him. And confession opens up then the, the floodgates of forgiveness, which not only washes away your sin, but also the guilt of your sin. And that was a liberating lesson that David learned at a point in his life when he was completely overwhelmed by the guilt of secret sin. And this is the lesson that he sought to pass on to others here in Psalm 32. Now, again, while there's no way to be sure what the historical background of the psalm was, David most likely wrote it after he confessed to God his sin of adultery and murder. As I mentioned earlier, David had gotten another man's wife pregnant, and in order to hide his sin, he ordered her husband to be murdered. But even though he had succeeded in in covering his tracks, David was miserable. And he suffered the torture of living with a guilty conscience, and he was out of fellowship with God, and he, he felt God's hand of discipline weighing heavy upon him. And yet he stubbornly refused to acknowledge his sin to God for almost a year. And it wasn't until God sent the prophet Nathan to confront David that he finally broke and confessed his sin to God. And as we already learned this morning, Psalm 51 was that prayer of confession that David prayed. We have that preserved by the Holy Spirit in the scriptures. Can you imagine that? The most vulnerable intimate prayer you ever prayed before the Lord or to God preserved for others to to know and read. That was Psalm 51. And and really, Psalm 51 is just a, a heartfelt cry of a broken and repentant sinner before God. And David begged God for mercy. He admitted his sin to God and he asked God to forgive him and to cleanse him and restore him. And he recommitted himself to worship and obey God like never before. And toward the end of that moving prayer of confession and consecration, David made a promise that in response to God's forgiveness, that he would teach other people what he had learned through his painful experience of covering up sin. Psalm 51, verse 13, you may remember this. We read it this morning. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted or turned back to you. I personally believe that Psalm 32 was David's way of carrying out that resolve that he made in Psalm 51. That his aim here in Psalm 32 was to teach other sinners like us to never cover up our sin like he did, but to always confess it so we could know the blessing of forgiveness and the joy of living without any guilt. Now what is unique about Psalm 32 is it it combines several features of um, poetic literature in the Old Testament. It expresses praise and thanksgiving, typical of the Psalms, but it also includes wise instruction, similar to to what we see in the Proverbs and in in Ecclesiastes. And so it's like a a proverb embedded in a Psalm. It's It's a wisdom song. And so while David was praising and thanking God for forgiving him, he was also teaching others the foolishness of covering up sin in contrast to the wisdom of confessing it and coming clean before a forgiving God. And so he he started in verses one through five um, to, to recount what he had learned from his own experience, 
when he had foolishly hid his sin, and then the exhilarating sense of relief that he felt when he wisely confessed it and was restored to a right relationship with God. And then the remainder of the psalm that might not seem to have much to do with the first part of the psalm, they really are connected, and I want you to see how. He, he, he then takes on the tone of a teacher in verses 6 through 11 and encourages us to go to school on his experience and learn from his example. And so we could see in this psalm two, David using two means to teach us the wisdom of confessing our sin to a loving and forgiving God so that we can enjoy God's peace and protection that comes through living a life with nothing to hide. And again, verses one through five, David is simply replaying the vital lessons that he learned about coming clean. And then verses six through 11 is he relays those vital lessons to us. Another interesting note about Psalm 32 is that it seems that David used um, what's called a chiasic structure, a chiasm, which is um, a literary device that uh, Old Testament writers would often use, and a chiasm is named after the Greek letter chi, which is, um, looks and functions like the English letter X. So you think about this um, in, in, in a picture of, a, of the way a psalm or a poem is written, and, and so it's named here for, for the inversion or the crossing of related elements in parallel constructions that provides helpful insight into the author's flow of thought. For example, if you had six verses in a psalm, for example, or a poem, uh, verse one would correspond with verse six, verse two would correspond with verse five, and verse three would correspond with verse four. And so it's, it, it's really kind of shaped like an X, if you will, uh, the way uh, a poem like this, a chiastic poem was written. And so it seems that David arranged this, this wise instruction in this chiastic structure, again, which you will see reflected in the outline that we're using this morning, and hopefully you have one in front of you. Uh, each of these two main sections can be divided into the same three headings, only reversed. And again, I think it just provides some extra insight into what David was was saying in this psalm. So let's look first at how David replayed the lessons that he learned about coming clean or confessing sin. The first lesson is the result of coming clean. The result of coming clean. What is the result when we come clean before the Lord? What does he say? How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and a new spirit there is no deceit. That word blessed means happy as opposed to sad. Um, and let's be honest, hidden sin, secret sin, makes us unhappy. It, it causes us to be depressed. Sin steals or robs our joy. By the way, this is the only, or only the second time that a, a psalm begins with this word blessed. Of course, you know the first time it's used in Psalm 1, which talks about how blessed is the man who walks in God's way. Well, this psalm talks about how blessed is the man who didn't walk in God's way, who, was, who sinned, but who has repented and experienced the joy of being forgiven. And the fact that David repeated it two times, this word blessed um, or blessed in two verses shows that a forgiven man is doubly blessed. Notice also how David used three synonyms for sin, three different words for sin to give us a, a comprehensive understanding of the nature of sin. And again, we can all relate to this because we are all sinners by nature. Notice he says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. That word transgression simply means rebellion. That sin is an act of rebellion against God. It's a, a breaking loose or tearing away from God. It's, it's God drawing a line in the sand and saying, don't cross that line. And we just look at him and we step across that line. 
Notice the second word, the word sin, whose sin is covered. The word here simply means failure. That, that, that sin is an act that falls short of the revealed will of God. It's not living up to the standards that God has set for us. This is the same uh, word that's used or the idea that's used in the New Testament about sin being uh, falling short, right? Like a, a, an arrow uh, being aimed at a target and it just, it just falls short of the target. And then the third word here is iniquity. Verse two, how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And the word here simply means corruption or distortion. In other words, sin is an act of perversion. It's twisted, it's crooked, it's, it's, it's deliberately veering off the path that God has clearly mapped out for us in his word. Also notice how David joins each of these three vivid words for sin with three bold expressions that explain the, the completeness of God's forgiveness of sin and exalt God's grace as greater than all of our sin. Notice he says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Literally lifted off, carried away. And so forgiveness is is the act where God removes sin along with all of its guilt that goes with it. The, The picture here is of a heavy burden being lifted. I imagine for some of you, what comes to your mind is that beautiful scene in Pilgrim's Progress where Christian is is climbing up this mountain with this backpack which represents sin and this burden that he's carrying and he's trudging up this hill and he finally gets to the top and he sees the cross and that backpack just breaks off his back and rolls back down the hill into the grave and is never seen again. It's a beautiful picture of what happens when we're forgiven, when we come to Christ and we're forgiven and that, that, that burden that we've been carrying through life, our sin, is lifted and it's gone. And it says that Pilgrim responded with a glad, lightsome, merry heart. He was so overjoyed. Another good example of this carrying away concept is the scapegoat in Leviticus chapter 16 and this was one of the ways God had designed for the people to visualize him forgiving them and so the priest would bring in this, this, um, this goat and, and, uh, and, and it would remain alive. They would kill one, sacrifice one and keep the other one alive and he would put his hands, the priest would put his hands on the head of that goat and confess all of Israel's sins on that goat as if they were being transferred to that goat and then they would send rather than killing the goat they would send that goat out into the wilderness they would release it in the wilderness and would run away and never come back the scapegoat again visualizing for the nation of Israel that God is carrying your sins away Psalm 103 verse 12 as far as the east is from the west so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Notice that's not all. He says, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered or atoned for or paid for. And so this is the gracious act of atonement by which the sinner is reconciled to God. And this is uh, the word frequently used in connection with sacrifices where sin was, was covered by the sprinkling of blood on the altar. Consequently, sin becomes a matter of the past. He puts it, God puts it behind him, and guess what? He allows us to put it behind us as well. Isaiah 38, 17, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. We come to God, we confess our sin, he takes it, and he goes like this. It's behind him, and it can be behind us as well. But notice, thirdly, how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. This word impute or imputation, where we get the New Testament concept of that, is the idea of being justified. 
which again is an act whereby God declares us not guilty, that we are now innocent. Um, this is a, the bookkeeping term we've been learning a lot about in our study of the book of Romans that refers to placing something on a person's account. In other words, he doesn't count it against us. He erases it from our account. He, he cancels our debt. He wipes the slate clean. Our sin is not just forgiven, it's forgotten. Isaiah 43, 25, I even I am the Lord who wipes out your transgressions and I will not remember your sins. Obviously, an omniscient God cannot forget anything, but he chooses not to dwell on our sin or bring it up again. He, he acts like it never happened. One commentator said it this way, quote, our sin is buried forever in the sea of God's forgetfulness. So, we're talking about the result of confession here. And it's sheer joy, it's sheer happiness and a sense of total relief based on the knowledge that our transgression is forgiven, our sin is covered, our iniquities is erased, and now nothing stands between us and God. In other words, there is no deceit in us. Don't miss that last phrase, and in whose spirit there is no deceit or no guile. We have be, be, been completely open and honest before God. We've held nothing back. There's nothing hidden in our lives. There's no secrets. That, by the way, is the secret to living a guilt-free, joy-filled life is to have no secrets. So that's the result of coming clean, but notice the next thing he replays in his mind here as he writes this song or psalm is the resistance to coming clean. The resistance to coming clean. Verses three and four. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. Through my, through my groaning all day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. So David here described what his life was like during that year or so when he was living in secret sin. In other words, before he confessed. And by sweeping his sin under the rug, if you will, and refusing to deal with it, he consigned himself to a life of misery and suffering and he had invited God to chastise him and chasten him, which God promises to do. He promises to discipline his children when we sin in order to demonstrate his love for us and to prove that we are truly his children you might just make a note, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 and, and following, uh, that it, it, where, where the writer says that God disciplines those he loves, those who are his children. That, that's what God does. He disciplines his children. He loves his children. It, it's like we who are parents, we, why do we discipline our kids? Because we love them. And we want them to walk in righteousness. Which leads, this, leads us to this conclusion. That if you can sin and get away with it, and if you experience no negative consequences or no guilt feelings when you sin, that may be an indication that you're not a true child of God. Spurgeon said it well. He said, quote, God does not permit his children to sin successfully. In other words, God doesn't let his kids enjoy sin, at least not for very long. I don't know what your personal experience is, but I have a hard time enjoying sin. I'm typically miserable when I'm doing it and obviously miserable after doing it. And so David's admitting here 
how God's hand of discipline weighed heavy on him. It, it felt like it was going to crush him. He was going to be crushed to death. And God let loose the hounds of heaven, as they're called, and they had him on the run. And there was no escaping them, and they relentlessly pursued him day and night, and he had no rest or relief for his weary soul. And not only did he experience the mental and emotional consequences of sin, he also had to deal with the physical consequences of sin. Notice he says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. So David portrayed himself as as just groaning and crying out in intense pain and agony and he described his life like a wilted plant in the Texas heat. If you've got flowers that you planted in the spring and they've looked beautiful for several months, but now they're toast. They're just all droopy and wilted, and no matter how, seems no matter how much you water them, they just, they just can't stand the Texas heat. They can't handle the fever heat of summer. And so he explained how his life juices were just dried up like this plant without water in the middle of the summer. I mean, sin literally sucks the life out of us. And so David's soul was shriveled and his strength was sapped and he was a a physical and emotional wreck all because he let unconfessed sin fester in his life until it got so bad that he had no other choice but to confess it. And when he did, sin came out like, sorry for this, but it's true, like pus from a nasty boil. And just like when you lance an infected boil, right, it hurts like crazy, and then you go ahead and lance it, and the, 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 the relief is immediate. And so we see the result of coming clean and the resistance to coming clean, but notice verse 5, the response to coming clean, Okay? So we've seen what God does when you come clean. We see sometimes what happens when you don't come clean, you resist coming clean, but then what is our response to all of this once we come clean? Notice verse five, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And so after David was confronted by Nathan, he humbly admitted his sin to God. He stopped playing playing hide-and-seek games with God, and he finally uttered the words that God had been waiting to hear, which are simply, God, I agree with you. That's, That's what it means to confess, is to say the same thing as God says about our sin. I agree with you that what I did was sin. It dishonored you. It displeased you. God, will you please forgive me? Notice the same three words for sin that he used in verses one and two. He repeated again here in verse five, but in different order, again, to emphasize the the comprehensiveness of David's confession. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Notice that David didn't minimize his sin, he didn't justify his sin, he didn't make excuses for his sin, he didn't blame others for his sin, he just came completely clean, he was just totally honest. And what did God do? God responded by opening up the floodgates of forgiveness and washed away not just the sin, but also the what? the guilt that always accompanies sin. I mean, that's the worst part of harboring sin in our hearts is the guilt that we feel. And I think guilt could 
perhaps be the most miserable feeling in the world. That's why people will do anything to get rid of it. They'll make excuses. They'll explain it away. They'll mask it with chemicals. They'll, they'll even encourage more sin to this desensitize their guilty conscience. I read years ago where a psychologist had counseled a, a woman who was having an affair and she felt guilty about it. And he said, well, just keep doing it until you stop feeling guilty. I mean, this just flies in the face of the way the Bible says to deal with guilt. The Bible clearly teaches that all guilt is real. The reason why you feel guilty, the reason why I feel guilty is because we are guilty. And guilt is the result of knowing that we violated God's standard and we deserve to be punished for doing something wrong. It's, it's, guilt is typically evidence of sin. Warren Wiersbe said it this way, quote, guilt is to the conscience what pain is to the body. It tells us that something is wrong and must be made right or things will get worse. We've all had that pain, ooh, ouch, what was that? And, and you kind of ignore it for a little while and it gets worse and you think, okay, I gotta stop ignoring this pain and sure enough, you go to the doctor and you find out you get an x-ray or an MRI and you have something actually broken or torn and uh, it would have only gotten worse had you not gone to the doctor, but it was that pain that tipped you off. Well, in the same way, it's the guilt, right, that tips us off, that there's something that we need to address in our heart and our mind and our soul. And the way to get rid of guilt is to not go to the doctor, it's to go to God and confess to him whatever we're doing wrong and ask him to forgive us, and God will graciously respond by forgiving our sin and our guilt And sadly, David had to learn this lesson the hard way. But once he learned it, he wanted everyone else to learn it too. And, and again, to go to school on me, he's saying, hey, go to school on me. Don't, don't go down the path I went down. That's a painful road. You don't want to go there. You don't want to be me. So learn from me. Take, take the easier road. Learn from somebody else's hard knocks. And so now in the remaining verses, he relays vital lessons that he learned about coming clean. And again, we we are going to see the same three subpoints, but just in different order. So first of all, we see the response to coming clean. So verses six and seven correspond to verse five. Notice he goes on to talk about the, the response, how, in other words, how we should respond. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. So David wanted everyone to know who was reading this song or who would ever read this song. He wanted them to know that the same kind of grace and mercy that he experienced is available to any godly person who's willing to come clean with God. So he exhorts those who are in pursuit of godliness to follow his example by openly and honestly confessing their sins to God in prayer. Let everyone who's godly pray to you so they can know the incredible joy of forgiveness. In essence, what he's saying is, hey, listen, now you try it. (laughs) You try it, and God will do the same thing for you as he did for me. And so he encourages all of God's people to prove their Lord in the same way. But he gives a warning here and he says, hey, don't wait until it's too late. Notice he says, pray to the Lord in a time when you may be found. There's a sense of urgency in David's call to prayerful confession that that we shouldn't presume upon the grace of God by putting off Confessing sin. Sometimes we think to ourselves, well, you know what, I've got, I've got some time. I can still sin for a, a little bit longer, maybe just, just one more time, or, or, or this is going to be the last time. We justify our sin, don't we? But the sobering reality is that the day of God's grace 
won't last forever. And the day of judgment is coming and no one knows when it will be and on that day it will be too late to repent and find forgiveness. And so David's exhortation here is to seek God's forgiveness now while there's still time. The prophet Isaiah said it this way, Isaiah 55 verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Look back at verse six. He says, therefore let everyone who's godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. In other words, in response to those who confess their sin to God, God will keep you from drowning in your sin. And he'll go from chastening you to protecting you from the kind of trouble and adversity that pursues unrepentant sinners. Proverbs 13, 21 says very simply, adversity pursues sinners. Adversity pursues sinners. I heard a man say it this way, that when you choose to sin, you choose to suffer. Notice he says, verse seven, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. So God will no longer be the hound of heaven in your life. He'll return to being the hiding place in your life. He'll shield you. He'll surround you on all sides and deliver you from bondage to sin. And so that's the response to coming clean. Notice he goes on to talk about the resistance to coming clean. And in verses 8 and 9, he picks up that theme again that he was uh, talking about in verses 3 and 4. Notice he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or, the, or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check, otherwise they will not come near to you. Now, I used to think that these two verses were spoken directly by God, but after studying this psalm in more depth, it makes better sense to me that these are the words of David, even though the my in verse eight in, in my translation has a capital M, again, hinting that this was God speaking. But let me tell you why I think this is probably better understood to be David's words, because in this part of the psalm, David has assumed now the role of the teacher, the counselor, the man of wisdom who who wants to instruct and counsel sinners to not foolishly cover up their sin, but wisely confess it and repent of it. Notice the three wisdom words here. I will instruct you. I'll give you insight and understanding. I will teach you. I'm going to point out the right way. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. I'm going to give you some advice. And when he says, I will counsel you with my eye upon you, I think this is David's way, perhaps, of expressing care and concern for his students by assuring them that he would keep a watchful eye on them. So they wouldn't go astray or get lost. And so he's providing them with supervised instruction. And so the kind, this is the kind of master-student relationship when a, when a look is, is all you need, right? It's, in you parents, you kids, you know sometimes all it takes is a look. Mom or dad doesn't have to say a word. They just have to give you the look. And you know that communicates volumes, Right? So he's saying, I've got my eye on you, and I'm here to help you. And so he says, don't be as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. And so here, David used the the example of, of two stubborn animals, a horse and a mule, that need to be forced to go in a certain direction using a bit and bridle and at times a whip. Proverbs 26.3 talks about these animals. 
A whip is for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. Again, see the wisdom literature seeping into the praise literature here of Psalms. But, but his point is, is, is basically this. Hey, don't be stupid and stubborn like I was. I was like a dumb, hard-headed mule that refused to, to do what I was supposed to do. And God had to ride me until he broke me. And it makes sense why David's confession in Psalm 51 climaxes in verse 17 where he said, the sacrifices of God are a what? Broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. His point is that, that godly people willingly and humbly and submissively confess their sin to God. They don't wait until they get caught of the, or their sin comes out in the open or they're forced to confess. They're, they're motivated by this internal desire to be holy and pleasing to the Lord. And so David was encouraging us to not resist him but to have a soft, submissive, teachable spirit or we'll never be able to learn the vital lessons that he's trying to teach us here. And then finally, he's back to where he started with the result of coming clean in verses 10 and 11 where he, again, returns to the original theme of verses one and two. Notice verse 10. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. So David contrasts the way God deals with the wicked and the way he deals with the righteous. And the wicked foolishly resist him and refuse to admit what they're doing is wrong and how they're living is wrong, and as a result, they experience endless grief and guilt. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Their life is not only sad, it's hard. Proverbs 13, 15, the way of the transgressor is hard. But those who wisely trust in the Lord and acknowledge their sin and seek forgiveness experience his gracious and merciful protection. Their lives are surrounded, it says, by God's love, and, and consequently, they're happy. He who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy. And so David here is calling on righteous people, the ones who choose to do what is right, who have a right heart before God, to be glad, to rejoice in the Lord, and again, he's right back where he started from. He opened the psalm rejoicing in the forgiveness of God. And now he closes the psalm by inviting all those who have followed his instruction and confessed their sin to rejoice in God's forgiveness and all of its fringe benefits. Which is the natural result of being forgiven, right? Having your, your guilt gone is exhilaration, which makes you want to shout for joy. And he says, look at the last phrase, all you who are upright in heart. Those who are upright in heart are the same as those in whose spirit there is no deceit, in verse two. The same person. He's talking about the same kind of person. A person that has nothing to hide is upright in heart. A person who is upright in heart has nothing to hide. There's no deceit in their lives. And only those who have nothing to hide can truly experience the joy and peace of guilt-free living. Ironically, David and Bathsheba had a son named Solomon. Despite all the sin involved in their relationship, God blessed them with a son who wrote the book of Proverbs, or most of it, much of it. And I think this entire psalm, Psalm 32, is summed up 
by one proverb written by the son of David and Bathsheba. Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. I love that verse. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Here's the principle. What we cover, God will uncover. But what we uncover, God will cover. Amen? And he covers it with the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus shed his blood on the cross to pay the penalty that we deserve because of our sin and our unrighteousness, our not doing what is right. And when we confess our sin, we confess our faith in Jesus Christ as the means that God has provided to cleanse us from our sin, then God declares us righteous. He declares us that we've been justified. And we don't have time to look at it this morning, but I would just commend to you Romans chapter four, verses five through eight, where we know the doctrine of justification is explained more clearly, more thoroughly than anywhere else in the scriptures. And guess what verse, Old Testament reference, that Paul quotes in describing how a person is justified? He quotes Psalm 32 and uses David's testimony as an example of, that a person is forgiven and made right with God, not by anything that they do, but by faith alone, apart from any good works. And just like David, any of us can get right with God by simply confessing our sin to him, seeking his forgiveness, which he's made possible through the death of Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning, Are you living with the joy of knowing that your sins are forgiven and that you're right with God? Do you know that joy? Or are you living with the guilt of unconfessed sin? If you're already a Christian, then you simply need to confess your sin to God and repent of it. And by the way, you may also need to confess your sin to someone else. Some of, some of you may need to have a very open and honest and perhaps scary conversation with your spouse or with your parents or with your boss or maybe one of us pastors or elders or maybe the person that's discipling you. James 5.16 says to confess your sins to one another. And sometimes that can be the game changer. Because we can confess our secret sin to God. He already knew about it. It wasn't a secret to him. And we feel good about it, but guess what? As long as it's a secret, it holds power over us. But as soon as we tell somebody else, like another human being, it loses its power. Why? Because somebody else knows that we struggle in that area. And so we can be held accountable. And there's there's such a relief that comes when you not only just come clean before the Lord, but you come clean with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Maybe you're not a Christian here this morning. You've, You've yet to commit your life to Christ. Well, guess what? 
same applies. You, you just need to confess your sin to God and place your faith in, in the death of Jesus as the means that he's provided for us to be forgiven for our sin. There's no greater joy in life than knowing that your sins are forgiven and that nothing, absolutely nothing, stands between you and God and you and others. I think the hymn writer captured it well. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this psalm that's so rich and full and deep and wide and it nails us right between the eyes because we all have a tendency to try to hide our sin and to cover it up. And uh, that's just part of being a sinner. It's what we do. And so thank you for this portion of your word that, that helps us deal with that tendency. And Lord, that we would learn the lesson that you wanted us to learn through the example of David and that he wanted us to learn. And uh, the Lord, that you would grant us grace to put this into practice and that you would, uh, Lord, help those who are here today who may need to have a hard, scary talk with someone and, and just be open and honest and lay aside falsehood and just speak truth and come clean and Lord, would you give them the courage and the, the wisdom to know how and when to have that conversation and that the person who hears that would have the grace to respond in a way that would honor you and would be a blessing to, to that person who's, who's, who's come clean with them. And, and so, Lord, and, and, and most of all, Lord, if somebody just needs to get saved today, needs to repent of their life of sin and just give up and uh, submit their life to Christ to live for him and to experience the joy of living forgiven from their life of sin. Lord, would you accomplish that work for your glory as well? In Jesus' name, amen.